ladies and gentlemen. An opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. A technology exists all around us that breathes and breathes life that makes food and rain, that protects us from floods and new disease. It is a technology with the power to reverse global warming, to prevent pandemics, to bring life back from the brink of extinction. It has existed for four billion years. It is the wild. Though the wild is powerful, we have pushed it to a breaking point, destroying it faster than it can recover. We don't need to reinvent the planet. We just need to rewild it. Protect what's still wild and restore the rest. This is just the beginning. Join the movement. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Changing the Narrative, Doom and Gloom Yields to Creativity and Possibility. It is my pleasure to welcome Ellen Stofan, the Smithsonian Undersecretary for Science and Research, and Sean B. Carroll, head of HHMI Tangled Bank Studios. They're going to have a brief conversation, and then we will welcome Irene Amoke, the Executive Director of the Kenya Wildlife Trust. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy, and thank you. Thank you for joining our conversation today. And, and we do want to have this as a conversation. So please, um, as you, um, we're going to have time for questions at the end. So please save them up, and we'll, we'll try to have a dialogue at the end. You know, I, I love this festival, and I love Earth Optimism, Sean. But at times, I really struggle. I'm more of an earth pessimist. Um, and, and yet, I think the things that we're going to be talking about at this festival even, even affect me in terms of optimism. And, and communication and science communication and trying to change this narrative, I think, is so critical. And, and you've been really successful through, you know, whether it's Corn Goza or Serengeti Rules, the B film that's going to be shown tonight telling stories that engage, that inspire. So how do you think of, how do we change this narrative? Well, thanks, Ellen. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the opportunity. I think, so background, I'm, I'm a biologist, so I have a you know, keen interest in everything that's alive. Um, and you know, we know that the trends have been negative for decades and decades. Uh, and there's been a lot of narrative about the what is, what could happen, how, things, how bad could things be. It's not necessarily inspired a lot of behavior change. And I think that, um, you know, stories shape the way we perceive the world. And so if we hear a lot of negative stories, if we hear the stories about, you know, oil spills and fires, but we don't hear the stories about the people who are working to, you know, restore species or to restore habitats or to protect, you know, a wilderness, um, we get an unbalanced picture. And I think it's, it's just, it's natural that things when really, you know, when really bad things happen and people are culpable for those things, it's natural that that makes the news and we see those headlines. But you gotta dig deeper because there's thousands of stories across the globe of people doing great things that are really pushing back in, a, in the other direction. So we have to put the spotlight on those people and tell those stories and build a different picture in people's minds, especially young people's minds, um, that there's plenty, of, there's time to change the road we're on if we, 
take the right attitude. Yeah, I agree with you, and I, I think it, it's the issue that we, we really struggle with here at the Smithsonian is how do you break through the narrative? Um, and one of my favorite science communicators is a woman named Catherine Hayhoe. Some of you may have heard of her. She's a, she's a climate communicator. And, and she really talks about how do you meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. And, and how do you start with talking about values? Yeah, it's really important. And Catherine's uh, terrific at it. I think, you know, one of the blind spots, and we're both scientists, you know, one of the blind spots of the scientific community is we sort of think that if you all knew what was in our heads, you know, the world would be fine. But that's just not recognizing that people, you know, are come from all sorts of backgrounds and they have a spectrum of values, but you can find those shared values. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm speaking on a day when we all know it's a tough, tough time for the country to find some shared values, but certainly living on the same planet and being dependent upon the same natural resources, we have at least shared self-interest. And I think that those voices that can sort of change the narrative, that can sort of surprise people that they may not be the people you expect. Um, you know, as a scientist, it's probably predictable what we might say, but from people in other walks of life, I think they have stories to tell and, and perspectives to offer that are, are capable of activating a much larger, you know, audience than, than just scientists or, you know, experts alone. Yeah, because there does seem to be this, I, I don't want to hear experts just tell me what to do. And, and I think this thing that scientists have struggled with over the last number of decades around climate change is if we just yell a little louder, they'll start <laughs> listening to us. And if we yeah. just repeat this one more time in, an e in a clever way, all of a sudden everyone will get it. And, and that's not working. So we really do have to change the narrative. And, and this idea of storytelling, I think, is is really critical it's it's group i mean this is you know it's also it's where our hearts are right so i think you know one of the greatest things about humans is our ability to empathize with anybody you know on, in any part of the world of any you know particular background this is what makes people people and i think if you tap into that empathy you have a real chance of you know changing hearts and and changing minds and you know speaking of communication i can also just sort of underscore that you know climate change actually dominates a lot of the narrative but there's, you can parse that from the biodiversity challenges. I can hear that, if you're hearing the same fellow I'm hearing in my left ear, but yes. um, anyway, so, somebody's a little louder than I am. I can outdo you, buddy, if you really want me to. Um, but the point I wanna make is about biodiversity. So biodiversity loss really has a separable set of causes. And biodiversity loss tends to be sort of local and regional, whereas climate change is this global issue. And therefore, a lot of biodiversity issues are reversible with local action. Those are a lot of stories that we have to talk about because I think climate change can be sort of paralyzing. Oh my goodness, all the nations of the world have to agree on certain things. But really, you know, fixing the Chesapeake Bay or regrowing a forest or starting a pollinator garden, these are all things that we have local control over. And we've got to highlight those things that we can control and that everybody can contribute to. Yeah, and I, I think I was just out in Montana a couple of weeks ago where the Smithsonian is, is working on um, a project with the American Prairie Organization where we're actually trying to restore um, and reintroduce species out into the prairie where we've um, tagged um, bison so that we're following how they're moving around the land. We've reintroduced swift fox um, and black-footed ferrets. We're trying to recreate an ecosystem that humans from about the 1890s to the 1920s wiped out every mammal over about 40 pounds, which is so discouraging, right? Right? You hear that story and you're like, oh, wow, that's like, but of course people didn't know any better. They weren't like evil intent. But now we actually have the ability to say, well, let's fix that. Let's set aside the land. Let's set aside land for people to still have economic benefit, but let's set aside land where you can actually bring an ecosystem back. We can put the wildlife back on the land. We can have a success and see the prairie the way it was in the 1880s before European settlers got there. And, and what's even more encouraging and inspiring to me is we're doing that working with the local Native American communities who have a deep knowledge of that land, who have a deep understanding of the value of the ecosystem and want to see it come back. So as you say, there's a community there that we are working with to co-develop solutions. This isn't a solution that we're coming in and saying, you need this, 
we're working with them to co-develop how to get to where we all want to be. A absolutely, and I think we'll hear those stories from Irene as well and, and Kenya. I think it's interesting, El Ellen's a space scientist, so I was joking with her just before this is saying, well, they're kind of making you focus on one planet now that you're here at the Smithsonian. But the Smithsonian obviously has reach all across the country and beyond. Uh, how is this sort of unfolding as an as a endeavor of m many parts of the Smithsonian to sort of band together and focus on the planet? Well, I think the work that we do in space science at the Smithsonian, whether it's imaging the black hole at the heart of our galaxy, whether it's the work we do participating in the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is going to bring back material from an asteroid, um, where that's the primordial material that actually makes up Earth. We have scientists up at the top of air and space, if it weren't under construction, you know, driving rovers on Mars, looking, did life originate on another world? So all those work that we do as the Smithsonian across the literally the universe tells us that there, as Carl Sagan much more eloquently than I could ever put it, the Earth is where we make our stand. There's no one to come rescue us. This is the planet that we live on, and it is such an amazing place. And so for my job, being able to harness the power of the Smithsonian, where we're working out in the Chesapeake Bay, we're working in urban estuaries, we're working in grasslands, whether it's in Kenya or whether it's um, out in Montana, we're working on coastal ecosystems that are threatened by pollution, by human activity. But we're not trying to take humans out of the solution. We're saying where communities and nature come together, how do we find solutions that work for both? So it's, it's amazing to me to sort of take that perspective of, this is the planet we actually have to make work. Because um, this is the only one we can actually live on. And I think that the other thing about the gloom and doom and the changing the narrative is that even scientists couldn't say until fairly recently about just how resilient nature really is. You know, 50 years ago, the crisis in the country, one of the first crises that was recognized sort of in environment and wildlife was the disappearance of our raptors. Bald eagles were down to about 500 breeding pairs um, by about 1967. There's now more than 70,000 breeding pairs of bald eagles, probably 300,000 birds altogether. So an enormous comeback, why? Because they were given the protection, taking away, for example, their vulnerability to DDT, and time. And we see this all over the globe with populations of various species, and we also see it with entire habitats. And, you know, 50 years isn't that long a time to see a dramatic return. But in lots of other cases, we see dramatic comebacks in 10 or 20 years. So the important thing is if you're saying to people, well, you know, if we just behave better now, in 100 years, things will be better. No, if we actually change some behaviors now, you'll see things in a few years to 10 years, you know, in your backyard, you know, in your Chesapeake Bay, et cetera. So uh, nature has a tremendous power to, to rebuild itself, essentially. And if we can tap into that power, and I think a lot of communities are seeing the benefit of tapping into that power. You know, when I just watch that, I'm a, I'm a crier, you know, so I guess that's probably going against my claiming I'm a pessimist, but that rewild.org, that little piece right there, I started to tear up, you know, it's so beautiful and you just see it's so inspiring and you're like, yes, we can do this. How do you, you know, you're involved with film. I find film to be one of the most powerful media for really reaching and doing that storytelling piece. And how, I'm curious, is that why you've gone so deep into, into film? Yeah, it is, it is absolutely. So, um, you know, it's pretty humbling as a scientist. You hope somebody might read your papers. Then I've written a number of books. You sort of hope a little smaller number might read your books, let alone pay for them. And then you realize that film, audience, the audience for film is 100 to 1,000 fold what it may be for uh, print communication. And film travels very well around the world. And really, what are we all coveting almost all the time is a, is a good story, right? If you bump into somebody, you know, what are you watching? What are you seeing that's new? Where's, you know, where can I find a good story? And so we crave that. And at the same time, we crave that experience. We actually want to feel those emotions, that joy, tears, whatever it might be. And film is so powerful because it, it engages all of our senses. You know, that, that soundtrack is happening maybe without us even knowing it. The beautiful imagery and, of course, our empathy for the characters, whether they're human or, or may even be wildlife. So film we know is powerful. Scientists have studied this. <laughs> we know that film is really powerful for people. And to make, to, to capture that power is a really collaborative enterprise. So that we put together a studio where we thought we wanted to make scientists an integral part of it 
and we really wanted to collaborate at a deep level with the best storytellers, the best craftspeople in the world um, to, to bring these stories to life. And uh, when, it, when it comes together, when it really happens, I think we have some, some special things to share. And as I say, that, that global audiences can, can tap into and you know, give them a way of seeing the world in a new way or at least seeing possibilities in a new way. What do you think are the most powerful stories that aren't being told? I think the most powerful stories are always stories of comeback. I think when, because you sort of have a natural sort of plot there, which is, um, you, know, it's, you know, think of any movie you like, you know, the hero gets in trouble. Can they get themselves out of it? How do they get themselves out of it? And then, you know, that's a common arc. Well, for nature, it's a similar sort of situation. You might have situations where uh, there's been some damage or destruction or loss. Uh, and the question is, can you, can you bring them back? And I think when you see it happen, um, you know, through storytelling, maybe even through long-term studies and things where you have even, you know, footage that captures all that, it's so powerful to see that, no, a place that maybe was left for dead. Um, I'm thinking of a place in, in uh, Mozambique in southeastern Africa that was, you know, pretty much given up on by the early 2000s. It used to be a, a jewel in, uh, in Mozambique's uh, wildernesses. And it was, it was left for dead after destruction from a civil war, from a long, terrible civil war. And, um, but 20 years later, it's a, you know, it's a model that the whole world is looking at for recovery. So this is Gorongosa. This is Gorongosa in, in, in Mozambique. There's many more stories like that, but it's, for me, it's one of the most powerful ones because meeting people who admit that they thought this was, that it was over, that, that it was, you know, um, ir, you know irrecoverable. And, but, and that's... Well, what made that succeed? So how, you know, that's so inspiring, but yeah. how do we scale that? So what, what made that, and when you were doing the film, like what, what did you really figure out? Like, wow, they've got what, the secret sauce. Well, there's a lot of parts of the secret sauce. I think some of that, some of the key long-term secrets are still being discovered. If, if I were to channel one of the leading philanthropists behind that, his name's Greg Carr, but this was a partnership between private philanthropy and the government of Mozambique that, that, rena that uh, restored this park. Um, he wouldn't be talking about wildlife right now. He'd be talking about girls' education. So over a time of 20 years of being in Mozambique, he learned that, you know, or they learned that one of the most important things was economic opportunity for the people in the Gorongosa area. And that has to do with markets for crops. It has to do with staying in school. It has to do with quality schooling being available. It has to do with, in fact, with the role of women in the family. And so... You'd think if we're going to talk about the recovery of a park, I'd, you know, we'd only be talking about elephants and hippos and all this kind of stuff. But it turns out that, um, you know, I, as I said, I think girls' education would be one of the most important things to change the balance of factors on the ground that would give Gorongosa a, a long-range chance. Um, but I think the other part of that secret sauce was this joint commitment to recognize that there was a potential jewel here and that if it could just be nurtured back to health, that there would be so many benefits to the country and to all the people that are around um, Gorongosa. And, and that's really happened, and it's happened in such a short period of time. And it's dramatic. I mean, when you think of places where probably 97% of all the large mammals were gone, and you come back here, and there's been an eruption where now essentially all those populations, at least in numbers, are back, kind of different quantities of different species. But, you know, the elephants, the hippos, the antelope, they're all there. Um, it's a spectacular rebound in a very short period of time. And Mozambique is a big country, and it's got many more wilderness areas, and so they've learned from Gorongosa. I think Mozambique's going to be one of, the, you know, one of the conservation leaders in the world for the decades to come. And that's not the position they were in only 20 years ago. Wow, that's incredible. And, and that's a perfect segue to bringing Irene Amoke um, from the Kenya Wildlife Trust up, um, because her organization is is really working at this same place. I'm going to let her sit down. Um, <laughs> Irene's really working at this same intersection of how do we find solutions? Again, this thing that we're really trying to think about at the Smithsonian, how do we find where humans and nature come together and how do we find solutions that work for both? And so Irene, Tell us about some of the work here, exciting work you're doing. Thank you, Ellen. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I think a short answer to your question is talk to the people. As scientists, we talk for their wildlife. 
And for a very long time, we've not been letting people who live with wildlife be part of the story and be part of the narrative. And so more and more we are finding to come up with solutions that are accepted and implemented, we have to work closely with the people who live with the wildlife. So at the Kenya Wildlife Trust, that's one of our main focus areas, really working with people and having people-powered solutions. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the things for a very long time, um, I saw the term recently, helicopter science, where scientists would come into countries like Mozambique, like Kenya, you know, we're here from the West and we have answers for you and we're gonna help you figure this out. Rather than really talking to the local people who lived in those communities, who already kind of know what the right thing to do is, they're just not being given a chance and a support to co-develop those solutions. And I, and I know you all are working with the local communities to say, what do you need? How do we, how do we help you get this ecosystem back to being a functioning ecosystem? Um, exactly, and there's a pushback right now from a lot of local scientists and local researchers, you know, to helicopter scientists who come in, as you say, from the West with perceived solutions to problems in Africa. And there are more African voices speaking for conservation, more community voices talking about what their desires are and how this can be done and achieved. And that's not to put aside, you know, information and expertise from outside, but I think having equal playing field and say, you know, we are coming to support and what can we do? And, and that's not just for out of the West, it's someone from Nairobi going to the Mara to offer solutions. We also need to listen to the Maasai and work really closely with them. So it's sort of, you know, both ways. Yeah, I think that's really, really critical. And um, I know with some of the work the, the Smithsonian has, be, has been doing in Kenya, we're really trying to say, how do we help train Kenyan scientists so that this work can continue and, and move forward and be supported? Yeah, and you know, we do a lot of work with Smithsonian in the Maasai Mara and hoping to expand to do more. And just at our booth here, we've got you know, young Kenyans there's Wilson talking about elephants and the innovative work they do. Simaloy and Delphine talking about the work they do with communities empowerment. You spoke about, you know, women empowerment and education for young girls, and that is key. Having women and giving them the agency to be part of solution making is, is really important. And also just being a driving force behind having collaborative efforts and people speak together. I think that also makes a big difference. Telling the story together rather than piecemeal storytelling is something else that we really try to focus on. And I think it's important for Western storytellers, if they're going to tell stories, tell the stories of the people where they're doing these things. I know, for example, uh, Wangari Maathai, yeah. I, I assume, is a national hero, yes. first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize, and this was around reforestation. And uh, while she's passed, you know, there are legacies here that, that are to be honored and, and cherished and, and, and told about. And I think that um, whether both, wherever the, wherever the storyteller comes from, but especially storytellers from Africa should be telling African stories. And so I think we, you know, our sensibility has to be a little different here in the West of uh, who do we want to hear these stories told by, not just yeah. told about. And uh, I, I think those, that movement is really happening. I, I think people are waking up. The, the sort of 20th century model of helicopter scientists sort of you know, cordoning off an area and calling that a park is just, that model is, is thrown away for something really, really different in the model of the, of the Kenyan Wildlife Trust. Yeah, and I think it's really powerful. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of 30 by 30. For those of you who don't know, 30 by 30 is a big effort to say we need to set aside 30% of the land on the globe to be protected by 2030 with the idea that there are ecosystems, like to some extent the one I was talking about in Montana, where we really have to get humans a little bit out of the way and let, let the wildlife recover. But there are so many more places around the world where we absolutely have to have economic benefit for the people who live in those communities. And so can we find a balance where we're bringing biodiversity back, where we're protecting wildlife, but yet letting people have cattle? And, and um, Irene, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you're working on solutions that allow cattle that, for example, the Maasai people have to have those be living in, in harmony 
with the wildlife also that lives in the Mara. Yeah, thank you. Right now, I think the, the buzzword is regenerative agriculture. And so how do we take that and transfer it into a place like the Mara, where it's a grassland, everyone's talking about carbon, how do we encourage that? How do we build carbon? And you know, talking with the Maasai who share the landscape, this amazing landscape with wildlife, and they have livestock, so it's what's the key unit, what's the basic thing that both wildlife and livestock need, and that's grass. So working with the Maasai in ways that grass can be used to improve their own livestock economy, build household incomes, but at the same time for scientists and researchers, improve wildlife health. So working with the local communities on you know, good animal husbandry that involves rotational grazing and taking care of, of grasslands. And I think that's a really important and sort of low-hanging fruit to get people to work in wildlife conservation, address an issue that affects them, as you said, and in the Mara, the issue is livestock. So I think once we have healthy livestock, then we can start looking at healthy wildlife and there'll be more space for both livestock and wildlife because they've coexisted for a really long time. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we just want to work with what's worked in the past and adapt to changes that are happening right now across the world. And I think having the Maasai and the local people offer and be part of the solutions is, is critical. But then again, that takes sitting down and listening and not trying to be the hero when it comes to things like that. Yeah, I think that issue of listening is, is absolutely so, so critical. And it's where I think science has um, failed in the past, but but co-developed solutions, I, I think, can really work. And some of the fascinating projects that we're doing um, is we've actually been tagging um, wildlife like wildebeests and watching how they move around. And some of the land is fenced and some of it isn't. And, and the more we can create pathways where, live, where wildlife can do what they want to do, but yet again work with local people who want to need it and have, absolutely have to have cattle, how do you make that work? I think is really, and it's an ongoing huge experiment that's amazing. Yeah, and yesterday we had a panel discussion on connectivity and you know wildlife corridors and how to expand these areas for wildlife, but then also taking into account the people who live in these areas. And again, it's co-developed solutions on how to create more space for wildlife. I mean, development, has to happen in a country like Kenya that for uh, we have our vision 2030 and development is a big part of it. So how do we have development and conservation sort of working hand in hand and that involves um, a lot of communication. But you know, we've said scientists, we are known for being gloom and doom all the time, but now the narrative is changing and we're coming up with solutions and not just going to tell people the world is ending. It's more like maybe the world will end, but this is how we can slow it down. And I, I know for a lot of people who live in these communities, the wildlife isn't their biggest problem, right? There's, there's so many, you know, we feel this today everywhere, right? You're trying to figure out, like, how do I support my family? How do I, and so how do you, how do you express that value that wildlife and nature bring to the community? So the Maasai, I'm talking about the Mara because that's where yeah. we work, have lived with wildlife for a really long time. So it's something that's accepted. And you know, uh, a few months ago, I spoke to a conservationist in Sri Lanka, and she told me that coexistence is not taught. It's a value that people have. And the Maasai have coexistence as a value. So we are not teaching them anything new. I think the question is how do we incentivize people to carry on coexisting? And that's where we talk about what are their core needs and what are the issues affecting them with climate change. I think the people who are living in areas like the Mara feel that the most. We'll talk about climate change in cities, and yes, it's felt, but the droughts and the floods affect the people who live in such areas. So working with them to find ways of adapting and even mitigating is, is really important. So when it comes to coexistence, they already have that value. So what can we learn from them and how do we incentivize them to you know, keep on having that? Yeah. Sean, how do, you, how do you think about how we tell that story of coexistence? Because I really, I really love that because it's, 
humans, again, we can't stand in opposition, opposition to nature. We have to stand with nature. So how do we do a better job of telling that story? Well, I, I certainly don't have all the answers on that, but I think that you can find that even a very small story, and there might be just a, you know, one person or a family living, for example, on the Mara, um, and if you tell it as a, you know, as a documentary, you might see their authentic experiences of what they're, what they're experiencing and how they're adapting to whatever that situation may be, but you develop that empathy. So you can tell that story at a very, very intimate and small scale where we just understand that this is our fellow humans this is what they're struggling with. And we all wonder, you know, maybe thousands of miles away, what can we do to help? What can we do to contribute to make life better for both humans and, and wildlife? So, you, so the story can be that small or it could be something, you know, more sweeping that we're used to, you know, sort of a, in, a, in a giant scope. But I, I think that you mentioned the tears and, and emotion before. We do have to hit people, heart. we gotta start touch people's hearts. And again, I think that comes down to identifying that Everyone over, around the world has very, very common needs. They may be in different circumstances, but they have very common needs of raising their family, of being healthy, of having, some, of having security, you know, of um, uh, educating their children, things like this. And I think if we respect all those, find those commonalities, illustrate them you know, through storytelling, uh, there's, a, there's a chance that that goes viral. Not bad things, but good things can go viral too. And Irene, how does Kenya Wildlife Trust think about that storytelling piece and, and getting people on board? Um, I mean, we live in the age of technology and young people have really great ideas and they're fearless. I sometimes, you know, take a step back and overthink solutions, but the young people at Kenya Wildlife Trust are ready to jump in. And, you know, one of the success stories is two of the youngest people in my team in Nairobi Know, talked about we have wildlife clubs in the Masai Mara where we work with young kids in primary school and trying to offer more education around the wildlife that they live with and when these two young people joined the organization the first thing they said was you're giving them storybooks about wildlife with people who they can't identify with and so what they did was write stories about the Mara about wildlife but from the perspective of a young Masai boy and a young Masai girl and that has changed attitudes you know, immediately. We have more people reading, more kids talking about the stories they want, taking the books home. And you know, for me, it's, that's refreshing because it's not something that I would have thought about myself, but giving younger people the space to try out new things and to test their ideas has, you know, has worked. And as you said, you, know, you can have a really small story or decide to go big and tell something that can be broadcast uh, across the country. But I think starting with something that makes waves in that local area is a critical first step. I think this is a sea change in outlook that, you know, there's a model and I don't want to criticize any of, any of our heroes, but, you know, a, a Cambridge educated naturalist who flies into Africa and sort of experiences Africa as the outsider and brings us back those stories, that's been the model for decades and decades. Right. But I really think exactly that, the, the, the stories told by the people who live there can be so much more powerful. Sorry for the shameless plug, but we just, uh, there's a movie coming out shortly, it's just been through the festivals. We, we are part of a film that focused on two brothers in Delhi who opened an animal hospital to take care of the birds of Delhi. And it, it won the Sundance Festival, it just won at Cannes. And so the world is embracing this story. And to my shock, it's a you know, you think it's a tiny, tiny little story. But in many ways, that story encapsulates the hopes that we all have, no matter where we are. And I think that's, that's what the opportunity you have. Take real people, their real stories, and all of us can tap into that hope and that optimism. That's amazing. Yeah, what's the name of the film? Oh, All That Breathes. All That Breathes. In theaters this fall on HBO in early 2023. <laughs> We're a philanthropy. I didn't make any money by making that statement, okay? <laughs> you know, this whole issue of optimism and no doom and gloom, um, how do you balance people to move to action? Because we're all part of organizations that are acting. So to some extent, we're all preaching to the choir here. So I'm really thinking about how do we reach out to people 
people are walking by us on the mall and not coming and listening to what we <laughs> wonderful things we have to say. You know, how do we reach beyond? I'm worried a lot of the times in, in this concern group that we talk to each other and don't get beyond that. So I'm curious, Irene. I think technology is one way of doing it. Citizen science has been around for a long time, but how do we get more innovative with it? Because it's sort of, I think the early days, it was if you see bees, you know, record it, put it on this platform. How do we come up with new, fresh ideas? And again, that's where people who are tech savvy, young people, I mean, how do we use TikTok for conservation? I don't have the answer because I don't know how to use TikTok, but I think there are people out there who can, you know, use that. How do we use film, which everyone watches to pass on the message and get people excited about some of the possible solutions out there? So I think, yeah, tapping into technology and what everyone can access right now is, is a good way to start. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think it, I'll sum up experiences in all sorts of places. I think when the general public sees what's possible and, you, and that's accessible to them nearby, it doesn't have to be a fancy wilderness like Yellowstone or whatever, just a nice park, the ability to maybe see some creatures that they've not seen before, they'll come. I guess that's, that's a different movie. If you build it, they'll come. If you make it possible, I think the public will then say, this is something that enriches my life. This is, this is something good. I want to see this happen. So it, not everyone has to be an activist. I think simply people will support this if they see uh, if they have the opportunity to experience some of these things, they'll, they, they want, people want to live in a, in a richer world. And if they see that that's possible, I, I think they're going to support it. Awesome. Now we have um, some time to take questions. And I apologize for the lively, wonderful music <laughs> that is trying to drown us out. Um, do we have any questions? You know, and I love that citizen, while we're waiting for hopefully someone to come up and ask us a question, I love that citizen science piece. When we were out in Montana, one of the things they talked about is we're having some of the local Native American high school kids look at camera trap photos because we're trying to track, you know, we can only, you know, GPS tag so much wildlife, so we use a lot of camera trapping. And having kids do the science of interpreting those photos to me brings them closer to the what what lives in their community and engages them in the science and the conservation work question i i, I come at this from a different uh silo i've worked low-income housing all my life uh and nationally and locally but the challenges in a lot of generic ways are very similar you've got you need something from a public uh, acceptance, uh, taxpayer support, or whatever, or at least buy-in to a particular approach that you're talking about, and there's resistance to it. In your case, you've got it a lot more, I think, uh, as a disconnect, like people don't realize the value of government. It's kind of like, bring the government down, but you know, don't mess with my street or my dairy price supports. Right. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know what your, your answers are. Uh, our answers are, of course, colored by the fact that the poorer you get, the more minority you get in the United States. It's just the way the numbers break. And so there's a heavy racial overtone to uh, uh, resistance to uh, affordable housing. At the local level, sometimes at the national level, it's, it's played in different ways, but uh, it, it's always an appeal to economic self-interest and an immediate uh, benefit to uh, individuals uh, that is engendered support for the type of community development and housing projects. And I hear some of that from your example of the buy-in that you get by not parachuting in. And the disciplines that I deal with in housing, they've been on top of that for 20 years uh, in terms of not parachuting in, but uh, going in and uh, becoming part of the community and understanding community solutions. But you did speak about the incentives and the bottom line is you got to provide these people with a living that replaces uh, a living that might not be biodiversologically desired. So uh, it is always some principle of appealing to a self-interest and I don't know how you make that connection with global warming because people won't see it until you know their pavement melts in their driveway. Yeah, I think I, I think that's something we really do worry about. And it came home to me years ago. I was um, talking since I was a NASA scientist. I went to talk to my children's K 
kindergarten class. And I had one of this little boy, I've been talking about volcanoes and how cool they are, and I work on volcanoes on Venus and Hawaii and all this stuff. And this little six-year-old, I kid you not, raises his hand and he says, what do volcanoes do for me? And I thought, oh my God, there's a future hedge fund manager. Sorry, apologies to the hedge fund managers in the audience. <laughs> you know, I was totally taken aback and I finally was like, uh, they make nice islands where you can go on vacation. Um, that was the best I could come up with. But I think this idea of connecting people back to the value of nature and when you consider the fact that, that nature is right now regarded as an externality, it's like an other. We don't bring in the cost of, of destroying nature into the cost of anything. And so somehow we have to connect to people that there is a value in the natural world and that solutions don't mean that people and their cattle, for example, have to go away. It's just maybe we have to find a different way of doing things. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, it, there's a compromise. And you know, the, like the six-year-old boy asked, what do volcanoes do for him? A lot of people ask, what does that lion do for me? And why should I allow it to kill my, my livestock? And so, you know, having that dialogue and coming up with win-win solutions, I think, you know, right now it is a compromise. And with climate change, as the gentleman just said, until the pavement starts melting, there will be a section of people who won't take it seriously. So rather than focusing on that group of people who won't take it seriously, how do we work really well with the group that are willing to sit down and come up with solutions? I'm going to take on that question, or at least that outlook a little bit, is, you know, I don't, we, we just didn't think about this a lot for a lot of the development, say, of just this country. And kind of the questions are, how much of the damage we've done, we've done is reversible? And I think the answer is a lot. And it's not that expensive. That's the other good news. And I'm really talking about biodiversity loss. I'm not even going to touch climate change for the moment. It's a little more complicated politically and economically. But a lot of the damage we've done to biodiversity, and, and you know, you've seen this, whether it's fish stocks or you know, bald eagles, whatever it might be, is, is reversible. And instead of thrashing ourselves and saying you know, how stupid we've been for whatever, it's just we've gotten, a little, we've gotten a little more aware in the last couple decades or so. So the next things we develop, the next things we build, we can do you know, more sensibly. So I think it's, I think it's sort of you know, not being sort of haunted by our past, but seeing that it's the next decision we make that's going to count a lot and have a lot of long-term impact. And uh, if, if, if things are truly as reversible as I claim, um, then I think we can see a lot of improvement um, in a lot of different places. Awesome. Yes. Hi, I, I'm from the state of Hawaii, and our people, the, the native people of Hawaii, have lived in harmony with nature for thousands of years. And I was listening to you, Irene, and, and it rang true that there's all of these stories about working with nature, with everything, and it struck me that there's a word that's missing, and that's symbiotic relationship. Because there are so many different types of life forms on this planet that live in a symbiotic relationship with something completely you would from the outside think is unrelated and you had mentioned the otherness that we have separated ourselves from nature when in fact we are part of nature and i think the storytelling that's really important that we really need is to address that symbiotic relationship and when that relationship is damaged then we all suffer, whether it's the animals or the, the various organisms on the planet. But using that term, I think, is a way to take that optimistic approach that we are all in this together, and that symbiotic relationship is what's really important. So we're in the business of building new relationships. That's just my comment. Love Very that. Nice you, Love that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, we are so pleased. Thank oh, quick question. We'll take a quick very, question. Very quick. It's sort of a comment back to the six-year-old as well as 
what this gentleman said. Should we bring back what John F. Kennedy said? Ask not what the volcano can do for you. <laughs> Ask what you can do for the volcano. Yes, love it. On that note, um, Sean, Irene, thank you so much. As I said in the beginning, I'm a bit of a pessimist. You guys have, have really restored my optimism. Um, and I hope you all um, are enjoying and continue to enjoy this amazing Folk Life Festival and Earth Optimism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please join us tonight for the HHMI Tangle Bank Studios presentation of My Garden of a Thousand Bees. It'll be a fantastic debut movie right here on the lawn, all the way down at the other end on that main screen. It is, of course, free. They're going to be handing out popcorn, and it will be followed by live folk life music. So please join us then. Thank you so much. <laughs>